Hey, welcome back to the Have a Third Wave Day podcast. In today's episode, I'm going to go through some of the history of our shop, um, talk about why I wanted to start a specialty coffee shop, and then also give some insight into what um, it's like to own a coffee shop. So let's go ahead and dive on in. So I got into specialty coffee after a trip to Rwanda. I tasted a cup of coffee there that was pretty citrusy. It was really unique to me. And my mom was kind of blown with like what the possibilities of coffee actually could be. Up to that point, I had only had some like local coffee in, in our area and they were all roasting the same kind of dark roasted um, coffees that you kind of expect um, from a non-specialty coffee shop. And then I got back to the States and I wanted to try to find more coffee that was like that coffee experience that I had in Rwanda. So I bought some more Rwandan coffee and it was okay. It didn't really meet my expectations, so I was disappointed by it. So I was like, okay, so it's not just Rwandan coffee. And then I ended up finding a um, company called Go Coffee Go. And on their website, they have like a list of tons of different um, roasting companies all across America. And they do different deals where you can like buy three from one roaster and get um, free shipping or different discounts on um, bags of coffee, stuff like that. So I found a couple different specialty roasters and started buying some coffee from them. And the first one that I received was the Ethiopia Natural. I don't remember who the roaster was. Um, I was buying coffee from tons of different roasters back then. Um, but what really kickstarted was this Ethiopia Natural that had lots of blueberry notes. A lot of you probably have had a similar experience where you had a natural process, most likely from Ethiopia, that maybe got you into coffee. I've heard lots of people that pretty similar experience to that. But it had lots of blueberry flavor. It was like, even in the aroma, it just smelled like fresh blueberries. Especially um, back then, that was pretty common for Ethiopian naturals to have way more blueberry flavor than we tend to see now. Um, but that's why like a lot of people continue to constantly um, seek out Ethiopian naturals is they had that experience one time where they have a, had a cup of coffee that just, even from the, from the aroma all the way through the taste, just tasted so much like fresh like blueberries that they're just like, what is this? I have to learn more. So got that coffee, was blown away, and I was like, what is this? Why aren't more people drinking this? Why is this not in our area? So I kept buying more and more coffee. It's at a time where I just started getting sick. I mentioned this in a previous episode, but I... Um, I actually developed some health issues um, right around this time. And so I was at home, um, I was in and out of the hospital, and I had more time on my hands, but I didn't really know where my life was going. My entire life up to that point was leading up to um, being a missionary in China and opening a coffee shop there. It would not have been a specialty shop because at the time of them planning all that, I didn't even know about specialty coffee. But um, I was going to use that for a platform for missions. That was the whole point. I was like, I, I like coffee, but I, I, didn't, I didn't have a passion for coffee. So then um, at that point, like I said, I was in and out of the hospital, and I didn't know what I was doing because I now um, the door was really just shut to being a missionary in China. I couldn't live overseas. I um, became deathly allergic to red meat. Um, I had alpha-gal, which um, it's pretty common in our area, so you might have met somebody that has it. But I got bit by a Lone Star tick and um, then developed severe meat allergies. Most people can, you know, still eat out and like go to restaurants and not have to worry too much. But for me, I became so deathly allergic that even cross-contamination from using the same utensils or cooking on the same grill, for instance, or something like that, um, could still kill me. And I almost died a couple times from um, people that thought that they could cook for me. And they're like, no, we'll be safe. And then um, they use the same tongs on a salad actually at the hospital, I was at the hospital for anaphylaxis. And then they're like, we promise we can cook for you. Like it, it'll be safe, we'll use clean utensils. And I trusted them and then I went to anaphylaxis and had to use two EpiPens and they almost had to intubate me. Anyways, so that's where I was at in my life though. I wasn't in college, I didn't have a job. I didn't have any future plan for myself at all. So I dove all in on coffee. Um, my health actually even prevented me from like really hanging out and having a normal life with friends. I really just stayed home most of the time if I wasn't in the hospital. And I went through, um, I went through a lot back then, but I did use that time to, um, to its fullest and um, spent six months um, just fully just researching coffee and learning more about like how to make porvers at home. I bought an espresso machine, learned how to make espresso at home, and then started just like taking notes on everything I could and then um, all the way through till November that, that year, I 
Um, I'm still not really sure what my health problems really were. I knew I had alpha-gal, but up to that point, the doctors just had no idea why I was continuing to go in and out of anaphylaxis. I went through like almost 20 EpiPens, and I like genuinely thought that I was going to die like just on a regular basis. Um, so then in November, I had a doctor's appointment. I saw so many different doctors that it was no big deal. Um, this wasn't a special appointment or anything to me. But I walk in and he shakes my hand, introduces himself, and then like the first thing he says to me is, I know exactly what you have. And obviously that was just a huge, um, just a, like um, relief to me, finally. like, Also, <laughs> you know, he was pretty confident to say that, but, um, but yeah, he, he diagnosed me with autoimmune chronic idiopathic urticaria, um, which is just reoccurring hives without um, doctors really knowing a reason for them occurring like that. Um, it's autoimmune disease. So I went on immunosuppressants, tried one, made me really sick, tried another one, and then finally got on the right medicine, and then the recurring anaphylaxis stopped. Um, at that point, I was still like determined that I was going to go to China. I just didn't know how or when, so I didn't have a plan for it, but I was like, I'm going to go to China. Um, which for a missionary to try to, you know, tell God what to do instead of the God telling what the missionary to do, it's very backwards. Um, obviously, that wasn't what God had for me. And I knew that even with, um, with an autoimmune disease like this, even though it could stop the anaphylaxis from happening, stop having hives all the time, for time periods, I knew that it would come back at some point. And it's a very rare disease. So, like, I'd have to be, you know flying back to America while potentially having an anaphylaxis. And I was like, that's just not wise. And I um, talked to one of my mentors and he was like, he's like, do you really think that this is what God still wants for you? And I was like, I had to just let go and go, no, it's not. And I knew that it wouldn't be missions if it wasn't for him. If it was for, if it was for me, that's not missions. So I gave up on the idea of going to China. Um, but then I didn't know what to do still, but I did have this passion for coffee. And a family um, came up to us, they were like family friends of ours, they wanted to do a coffee shop and uh, attached to their business. And, you know, it was a, they, they wanted me to like, come up with a like business plan. They said they, they like sat me down, had a meeting, and I was just completely out of my comfort zone. They um, asked me to come up with a business plan that had um, proof of like our um, plan for RO, ROI, like um, plan of the return of their investment, um, show their like um, our profit margins on drinks, and then cost to good ratio, and it was all this stuff that I didn't know anything about. Wrote it all down, <laughs> googled it, and then had to learn how to write a business plan because I was a missions major. I didn't know anything about business at all. Um, my dad's a um, business owner. My uncles are business owners, um, but that didn't really help me. Um, so I just didn't know what to do or what, um, but I just had to just look it up and do it everything myself. Um, I, um, taught myself how to do a lot of things in life. So I learned how to be a, a business owner. I, I, um, came up with a business plan and I submitted it to them. Everything was going pretty well. It looked like, but then they decided eventually to go with someone else who um, had more experience. They're like, oh, well, you can manage the shop for him. But that wasn't what I wanted to do. And the pay was still like minimum wage. And I was like, that's great, but I need to find like a career. And now at this point, I have a passion for coffee and I have a business plan. And I'm aware that I can, I can make this work. I'm like, I was determined that this could be an actual career for me. So I started looking for places to um, for to build a coffee shop, and originally I had this idea that now is really silly looking back on it. But I was like, I wasn't going to fully commit, um, which is never really a good thing. If you're not willing to fully commit to a, an idea that is as big as owning a business like a coffee shop, then it's not worth doing. Um, but I had this idea of. Uh, opening a coffee shop inside of another business, um, which would have, you know, saved me money on rent. We wouldn't have had to do like tons of furniture. It's going to be like to go only. It's going to be really simple, really cheap. But 
I don't think we would have re- been where we are now if that's where we started because it was inside of a business that wouldn't um, have had like a lot of people already going into it and it wasn't in an area that had a lot of foot traffic um, which our entire city doesn't really have a lot of foot traffic unless you're downtown and this was in forest so no foot traffic um, but I didn't know like back then that that wasn't that wasn't what I needed to do back then I didn't know where we would be or how far we could make it I just didn't trust um, God fully and then um, the next thing I know I um, you know formed an LLC I started getting everything together and then didn't really have a place for the business yet and the shopping center that we're actually in now was just being built um, and so it was in the right area it um, was in a like in forest where I grew up and I knew that this area needed a coffee shop even if it wasn't a special coffee shop this area just needed a coffee shop in it already so the fact that I, I was bringing something to my community where I grew up that I think was um, was very necessary at the time so everything started lining up and I was excited to bring something to my community um, where I grew up that I knew that they needed and then be able to bring specialty coffee to my area even in Virginia, there really wasn't much specialty coffee at the time back in um, 2014. So not only was it n- new territory for me, but also just for our entire area. Um, so yeah, I um, ended up getting a job in our um, our area at a different, um, not specialty coffee shop. I um, was already pretty experienced and confident in making coffee, but I wanted to be able to learn more about the service industry and also like what it was like just day to day in a coffee shop worked there for about a year um i stopped um, working there when my mom started having some health issues and so i wanted to be able to um go um take care of stuff at home and help her out um it was a good like way to just get some insight into what it's like um to be a barista so that way when i later was training baristas, um, I knew just more um, from their perspective. Um, Yeah, it definitely, I think, was necessary for me. Um, I don't think that everyone that is going to own a coffee shop needs to work as a barista, but I think it does give good insight um, into what it actually is like um, to be a barista. Um, And yeah, I definitely learned also some stuff as far as what to do and what not to do from like the management side um, as well. It did give me a lot um, just to um, go from and take away from it. So it was a good experience overall. So yeah, after that, while I was waiting for the shop um, shopping center to be built. So yeah, at that time I um, started buying equipment and I turned my family's garage into basically just a storage facility for all the stuff for the coffee shop. Um, there's like chairs and just boxes everywhere and like a pallet of coffee. Also like went up to Michigan. I bought my first um, like five pound roaster there um, from Mill City and um, it was a good roaster to learn on, and I still actually have it in my garage, but we roast all of our coffee currently on the Diedrich in the shop because um, it has twice the roast capacity. But we're planning on moving the um, five-pound roaster and the Diedrich to a roast facility where we can have more room for green coffee storage. Um, so we've, since we've um, outgrown um, our capacity here to store coffee. But, um, yeah, it, it was um, really great for my family to just let me, like, um, use their entire garage for storing stuff because we didn't have a place to keep everything. Those um, we didn't have. I didn't have a place to keep everything inside the shop because that wasn't even built yet. At that time, I also um, started hiring some employees, telling them that we were going to be opening. I don't even know when I originally said. I think I was saying like originally it was going to be like the fall, and then I was like fall 2015, and then spring 2016, and it ended up being like the summer. Um, of 2016, so it was like a full year after I hired some of my employees, um, which was, it was hard for them and it was also obviously hard for me because we're, we were just waiting for the shop to open and I didn't, I waited a full year after I had everything I needed for the shop before the, um, we were able to open. And that was due to different delays with construction, um, both inside the shop and outside the shops, so like we had issues with the parking lot and inside the shop they we had issues with our countertop. They kept bringing us the wrong countertop, like weird colors, and it was it kept being wrong. And then it'd be like another month for that. And then like we had we had just had 
just a lot of trouble which anyone that's ever had a, like a build out like um like a coffee shop you probably can relate to me on that but um yeah it, it i hired um like my first staff most of them were just people that god just kind of um brought together i hired my friend logan um we became really good friends at the time and he had he got into coffee because of me and then he knew a couple of people who knew a couple of people and before we knew it we started hiring some people that were really into especially coffee that were really passionate about coffee yeah they, they were a really big part of what made us um who we are today and they were a huge help um back then so in that course of the year while i was waiting for the shop to open i actually started dating this girl and i didn't have a lot going on besides just waiting for the shop to open so we like spent so much time together and we really hit it off and I like fell in love with her and I was like, I want to marry this girl. And like after dating her for like a month, I bought a ring. And so we got engaged um, in that winter and then in, um, in 2016. And then we like started planning the wedding and obviously tons of people said we were crazy because you know, it was crazy to marry a girl that you just met but um but yeah we um planned the wedding and then i found out that i needed a surgery um that really threw a wrench in the works we didn't know like um what to do i was like i didn't know the extent of the surgery at the time either but we just didn't know like we're getting married in august so surgery was in june so we ended up having a private ceremony in may with just our direct families and our pastor. So it was very minimal, but it allowed us to focus on what really matters, which was us um, getting married and just the celebration of that. So we um, had a honeymoon, we had like a month before the surgery, and then um, the surgery ended up being, like I said, like way more extensive than I thought. I ended up having nerve damage um, all the way down my left leg from my knee down. I had such extensive nerve damage that I couldn't um, move anything. Like couldn't flex my calf, I couldn't move a single toe, ankle, nothing. And um, so I had to get a walker and then, um, and that wasn't even enough to walk. So I actually had to get a custom mold of my leg with like a brace that went all the way down um, to my toes, all the way up my leg. And it was like, um, that allowed me to even just use a walker um, without just dragging my foot. So while we're, while we're trying to recover from the, the actual surgery, and then now I had this whole other problem, and it became impossible to do anything on my own. I couldn't, I couldn't even make it, like, I couldn't even stand up or walk or get out of bed or shower or, I couldn't do anything on my own. So now it made more sense to me why God allowed us to just feel so at peace with getting married so quickly, because now instead of having to have my parents or my brother like bathe me and take me to the bathroom and if i had like had they'd have to sleep in the same room and it would have been too much to ask for them and then too embarrassing for me to go through all that so instead now i have my wife there um taking care of me and she had experience as a cna and so she was used to helping people um helping people with stuff like this, like with a daily task already um, from working in a nursing home. So it just was a cool way of just being like, being able to see how God was just like, no, like this is what I have for you. This is the plan that like, and that's, I feel like that is why we were so comfortable with all of that, but all of that's happening. And then um, in June, and then I was on extreme like, um, I was on like painkillers for the surgery and then I was on um, nerve pain meds for the, all the nerve damage I was having because that, that pain was way more extreme than the surgery. The pain was, um, very, was so severe that even when I just like put my foot on the carpet, the sensation of the, um, the, sensation of the texture of the carpet under my foot felt like I was just being stabbed. It was extreme pain. Um, anything like touching my leg at all, even like putting on um, a sock um, was incredibly painful. I don't think I've ever been in as much pain as I was in from this nerve pain um, that I was going through. So I was on lots of painkillers from all that and I don't even remember like vivid details throughout 
the next couple months. Um, but our wedding um, ceremony that we had was actually in August. So we still we already had the photographer. We already had um, invited all, all of our guests. So we went ahead and um, still um, we went ahead and had the ceremony, but just used it as a celebration of our marriage and um, a lot of just be like kind of a, a party for just um, all of our friends and family um, to celebrate with us. Um, I was, because I was on, in so much pain, I was obviously like on painkillers from surgery and I obviously was walking around on my foot all day using a cane, but that was also caused extreme pain and swelling. And um, so wasn't the most fun for me um, overall. By the end of the day, I was just absolutely exhausted and in so much pain. But all of that's going on, and then at the same time, the shop is getting ready to open. So when the shop first opened, um, doctors were telling me that I wouldn't be able to um, walk again for at least a year. They said, the doctor was very scientific about it. She said, with this many millimeters of damage to your nerves um, and your body can heal on average this many millimeters per day. So therefore it's gonna take at least a year to two years for you to heal because you have an autoimmune disease so your body doesn't function as fast or as, like, as fast as other people. So I was expecting like a year to two years of being in extreme pain all the time and then not being able to walk without a cane and that, or um, a walker and I was like, okay, now I'm also opening a coffee shop and I'm gonna be on my feet all the time. And I, I had no idea how it was gonna work. But we opened in August and for the first, um, for the first little while I was behind bar making drinks, holding onto the counter or using a cane. And it was incredibly difficult. I had to constantly go in the back because I was like in tears because of how much pain I was in while trying to serve people. And so it was, a crazy crazy time looking back at it now um, I don't look back on it very often but all of that was happening and then uh, during our soft opening and then like within like I don't even know exactly when but I started being able to move my toe I started being able to start m moving my ankle a little bit and I started to like be able to walk way sooner than the doctor scientifically told me that I was able to God healed me in order to show me that he was there and that he was able to heal me and also was able to use that to be able to go back to the nerve doctor who, you know, go back to the nerve doctor who wasn't a Christian and didn't believe in God and was able to just be like, I'm healed. I can move my foot. You saw the nerve damage. You told me how long it would take to heal. And, and then she didn't have an explanation for it, but she said that she didn't believe in miracles but she, she didn't understand why I was able to be able to walk and recover as quickly as I did. And so all that happened very quickly. I went from like being able to wiggle a toe to move my ankle to move my calf. And then within like a month, I was like walking again without any cane, without even the um, brace that I had made for me. Like I was able to slowly start like doing stuff again without any help at all. And yeah, it was absolutely just awesome um, to be able to do that. But also just, you know, I was also now able to work behind bar without being in excruciating pain all the time. So that's how, how I ended up opening a coffee shop and some of the background for what led me to wanting to open a coffee shop. So I just wanna talk about what um, it's like to actually run a coffee shop now and uh, how that shifted from when we first opened till where I am um, now um, in my role. So when we first opened, I bought into the idea that I was a business owner, I needed to do everything myself. I tried to do all of the scheduling, I worked the most hours behind bar, I did all of the roasting, I, um, I did every single thing like that I could in order, and A, I was trying to save money on payroll um, to make it work, but then I was also just thought that that's what I was supposed to do. Um, as a business owner, I, I'm the one that's supposed to be doing everything, showing everyone what to do. And there, there obviously, you know, is some truth to that. Like you should be able to show your employees what to do and be the one that is in charge. But I was going about it the wrong way for the wrong reasons. 
and it took me a long time to really realize that because I kept dealing with a lot of um, like viruses and stuff in the winter that year um, because I'd work 80 hours a week and then I'd get sick and then I'd be out for a week or two and then I'd go back to working 80 hours a week and then it just kept being like a vicious cycle that I'm like I, this this has to stop so I ended up um, like working less hours behind bar and then try to figure out like well, um, like, like how can we expand this what can we do different and then I learned over time what my role would actually be like no one really teaches you how to be a specialty coffee shop owner um, then there's a lot of ways to do it and it really depends on like what your business model actually looks like now, are you roasting your own coffee if so then it's gonna look like probably closer to what it is, was for me where I was trying to like um, roast for other people I was spending a lot of time like buying green coffee profiling it and then um, going through the entire process of um, buying it, profiling it, and then trying to like dial it in on, you know, espresso and drip and pour over. And so I was like heavily involved in that, which I, I still am on. Um, that's one the one thing that, you know, I'm extremely passionate about. And so I always will want to be involved with that process. Um, but so over time, I um, learned that I didn't really want to be like behind bar as nearly as much. Um, as my roles kept increasing and different things that um, really started stretching my time, like I didn't realize how long I'd be doing stuff like emailing and doing stuff with employees and doing like stuff like for taxes and for like all, all the stuff that it takes to actually run a coffee shop, like doing accounting. I had to like learn to do things that I hate um, and do it. And I had to learn that I had to do things that I hate more often than I'm going to do things that I actually love um i have this i like um i love obviously like roasting coffee and you know like profiling it and then cupping it and doing quality control and you know um developing stuff for like blends or doing like um dialing stuff in for espresso or for pour overs and i love i do love like hanging out at the shop with our customers that are really into especially coffee and being able to talk to them and it's like i, I had to learn that although that is what makes me passionate about coffee and I obviously have to have that um, in my life otherwise I will just burn out and I've burned out so many times so many times um, especially in the first year it was a constant battle of like doing things I don't like doing and then being burnt out but then having a moment of like this is why I'm doing this and then like being passionate about it and then just going back into like this is so hard so frustrating I'm not making any money I'm not paying myself how are we going to make it and having to just battle with that is incredibly difficult. And you eventually get used to what your role should look like. And I eventually developed a healthier look on how I can, like, how I can balance the life of being a, um, being a business owner that has to do the things that you don't want to do and make the decisions to um, better your business, but also still feed into the passion that got you into the business in the first place. And so that obviously took me probably longer than it pro than it could have. I should have learned that a lot quicker. Um, I would blame not having an education in um, business or that I was young or that I had a lot going on with you know, the fact that I just got married and had surgery. And But in reality, like I am just hard-headed and I always try to force myself into learning things and doing things. and. Um, that's something I've worked on a lot um, and have had to grow into a lot, um, especially as a business owner and a husband and a father. Um, but that whole the first year of owning a business is as hard as everyone says it is. It completely just overwhelmed me. Um, like the amount of highs you have and the lows you have, and sometimes simultaneously, you can be so excited going to work and like see people in your shop and that nothing will ever beat that feeling of what like seeing people enjoy coffee and seeing people become passionate about coffee and then all because like your passion led into the decisions that opened this coffee shop up and seeing that spread and seeing people get excited for it and then the, there's nothing that is better than that and I still love coming into the shop today and seeing our customers like enjoying our coffee um, but obviously then you're gonna have lows when you're trying to make it financially and you're realizing that 
this might not work. And if it doesn't work, what do I do? What do I don't have a fallback plan. Like, do I just be a barista now after this? Like, what, what happens if, I, if this doesn't make it? And having to do that while also being a newlywed and, like, and having your wife trust in you, um, it, it's, it was a daunting task and it, it was extremely hard. But I think that's what made me want to try to work 80 hours a week. And I'm like, I can do this. I can save more money on payroll if I work 60 hours behind bar. I can do this. And eventually, um, Logan, one of my um, good friends, and he was an employee here, um, he was like, you know, you can, um, if you paid someone to do the things that only you can do, you'd have to pay them a lot more than a barista. So instead of focusing on being a barista to save money on payroll, it'd be smarter for you to just try to focus on things that'll actually grow the business. And that is exactly what I needed to hear and, and how I needed to shift from just trying to make it work Instead, I had to learn how to grow wholesale, how to do things with advertising and like do stuff with like social media and emailing people and doing like a lot of things that I didn't know were as important as they were at the time. Um, because when we first opened, we had a huge line out the door. We had tons of people just like um, interested in us and like our first month, like sales were absolutely crazy. Um, and then we didn't retain a lot of those customers because a lot of people were just like, oh, new 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 shop in town. And I'm talking that back then there was no other specialty coffee shops and very few coffee shops. So it was, you know, everyone came very quickly. And then eventually we learned that our sales were um, pretty terrible back then. Um, and I still was excited about it because, you know, people were enjoying my coffee and I, you know, um, I was excited about it. But I knew that we weren't going to make ends meet with the way the sales were, but as more people came in and more people got interested in our coffee and then got into our brand and then we eventually, obviously, we made it. We're we're here, we're here. So th um, three years later, four years later, crazy. Um, we obviously made it. We're here four years later now, um, coming up this August. So. It's interesting seeing how, how your perspective can change as a business owner and how you can learn how to do things that you don't like doing and then realize how to balance that out with things that you are passionate about in order to keep that alive and then be able to make it work and be profitable. And then it's just a whole balancing act and it's incredibly difficult. And obviously that's why um, so many businesses fail um, is that you have to be able, you have to be willing to you have to be willing to potentially lose it all. You have to be willing to put yourself out there and risk everything in, in order to be able to see your passion um, come to full fruition. And so it's awesome when it happens. It's awesome when you do make it and it's, and it is still the most fulfilling thing. And it still is awesome just to be able to know that I'm able to share my coffee with people and there's still new things that excite me every single year there's we do more and i think that we will continue to do that for as long as we're as long as you know we're open um every year we continue to just grow and do things that i never thought we'd ever do and you know we do origin trips and i mean not this year because 2020 and traveling doesn't really make sense but um but we, we did origin trip um, to guatemala back to back um last two years and we opened a second location um instead of a um, private business and we're our roasting keeps expanding and we're trying to do new things with education and like we're we're doing a lot of things that i wanted to do since the beginning of the shop when the shop first opened but it wasn't the correct timing but as we keep growing and expanding and things change it's um been an incredible journey for me as the business owner um obviously being able to finally pay myself, um, obviously that's a pretty key part of being a business owner, but being able to just see the shop grow. One of the things that I love about being a coffee shop owner is something that is very similar to what I, um, I loved about being a barista. I'm able to share my passion for something and be able to share that with someone and be able to meet tons of new, tons of people in our area and just sh serve them in a way that is unique, but also really fun and there's always something exciting going on in coffee and I think that um, I, I do not recommend owning a coffee shop for most people even if you're thinking about it I mean every single person told me 
do not do it. This isn't going to work. It's not worth the risk. Um, like, do we really need another coffee shop in our area? And I knew that this is what I was going to do with my life. I knew that I was going to own a coffee shop and that this is my passion. And I was willing to make those risks. And even if it failed, I knew I had to put myself out there and take all the risk that, um, and just give it my all because this is what I am. I am a coffee shop owner. Coffee is my life. And I wanted to be able to share my love for coffee and my passion for coffee and that experience that I had by drinking a cup of coffee that just blew me away and completely just shifted my entire um, view of coffee. I want people to be able to experience that. And so I knew it was worth it for me. I knew that if I can be able, if I can take my love and my passion for something and share it to people and then be able to use that even to be able to share God's love to people in my area and people around the world, then I will do whatever it takes to make that, that work. I knew it was, I knew it was worth it for me. I knew I was willing to risk it all. And I knew that if I, if it didn't work, that I could at least be able to say, I gave it my all. I didn't just quit. And, um, if you're like that, if you want to open a coffee shop, if that's where you're at, like I know tons of people that are in specialty coffee want to open a coffee shop, I'd say look at all the risk, read as much books as you can, ask different coffee shop owners what it's like in their shoes, and realize that you're going to be doing so much that you don't like, and it's not nearly as fun day to day as you expect. Um, you're going to be spend, spending tons and tons and tons of time doing stuff like QuickBooks and emailing and phone calls and making decisions that are really hard, like that impact people um, in your business and in your area. And you're going to come into the shop at midnight thinking that someone broke in and you're going to have to kick people out and then deal with like lawsuits. Like we had someone try to sue us because they fell and like um, it, even though we had a mop, like wet floor sign and, um, it, but you, there's so many things that you have to deal with and that you never expect. There's, it's a lot less glamorous than what you actually think when you're like, man, it'd be so cool to own a coffee shop and just like have a spot where my friends and my community can come and drink coffee. Cause that, that is a beautiful thing to be able to um, have that for your area and your friends and your um, community. But there's so much that you can't see from the outside. And a lot of the stuff that I do day to day is stuff that isn't that glamorous and so just my word of advice would be if you're willing to make it work if you're willing to do lots of math and make hard decisions and do accounting and you're willing to answer tons of emails and be stressed and never ever clock out and work till midnight and wake up at six and do it again and do whatever you can to make it work then maybe being a coffee shop owner is the right thing for you to do but being a coffee shop owner is definitely not for the faint of heart. For the amount of effort that you put in versus the amount of money you can expect to see even in the first four years is just definitely um, a lot less than you would ever expect. And it is incredibly difficult, but it can be 100% worth it. But for me, it is worth it. I would do it again 100 times. I, yeah, that's, um, that's just a little look into what it's like for me to, um, day to day. So many different people over the years have asked me um, different questions about running a coffee shop, um, and a lot of them were planning to open a coffee shop or are involved in a coffee shop now that they've helped open. And so I just want to be able to just share this with people because there wasn't a lot of resources out there for me when I was opening um, Third Wave. I I did everything I could to research. Um, I, I did everything I could um, for like reading books that are relevant to owning a coffee shop, but. I think give me the right perspective um, on like what my life would be like as a coffee shop owner or tell me like what to do, what what day-to-day -day operations would look like. And so I think that it could be really beneficial to someone. I hope it was. Um, I know this is probably gonna be super long um, by the time it's all done. So I hope that you learned something new about what it's like to own a coffee shop and a little bit more about our brand and what made me decide to um, open a coffee shop. Um, I know it's a little bit more personal and a little less about like um, di different topics in coffee. Um, but yeah, if you stuck all the way through it, then um, I really do um, appreciate it. And um, yeah, have a third wave day.